Yeah, I made my first record when I was 17, 18. And um, most people in the music business are just too old. That's always been a bit of a problem, really. I hear your footsteps in the street, we'll be Sort of thing. Quite seriously. Yeah. Well, I told Santa Claus I wanted an amplifier and an electric guitar, so that's quite serious, I suppose. Inspired by what? Seeing somebody on the TV or something? Yeah, but at that time, my sisters, who are much older than me, were really into Herman's Hermits and The Move and The Beatles and The Stones. So I was surrounded by all these glamorous pop stars. Madden. Well, East Kilbride is a kind of new town. Have you ever, ever seen the film uh, Gregory's Girl? then you'll get an idea of what it looks like. I've never been to Milton Keynes, but I'm told it's the same idea. So is it quite a bleak place? Well, I suppose if you're used to living in, a, you know, Camden or something, it, it would look like that. But it's pretty good. I mean, it's better than growing up in a slum. You do have, you know, nice grass bits, which they design for you and everything. It's a nice place for children and animals. You can't imagine it being a sort of creative community or anything, though. I mean, were you a sort of little flower growing up amongst the concrete or something? Well, not exactly a little flower. No, I suppose the first time I started hanging out with a lot of people who were like-minded was during the punk revolution of 1977, 78 and all that. What did you do in the punk revolution, Daddy? Hung around outside the record shop and browsed through their indie singles. And who were the people that you were bumping into hanging around outside the record shop? Um, well, funnily enough, we never saw the Jesus and Mary chain very much, although they grew up in the same, the same town. Um, there were a few bands around there, the New Town Scum being the most famous. <laughs> started to write songs during the punk thing and got together with uh, some people in Glasgow. Now you must have been awfully young during punk. How old were you then? About 13. But, um, I was already, already playing the guitar by then and sort of starting to write songs and all that. But they weren't very good. We ended up doing Clash covers most of the time. What were your songs like then? Apart from not mm, being very probably good. Probably a bit like Screwdriver or something, in retrospect. <laughs> God, you've come a long way, haven't you? Um, I don't suppose anybody watching this will actually remember Screwdriver. Really? Blackpool's <laughs> finest. <laughs> <laughs> so, Clash covers, and then what? Well, I suppose then, when we got into punk music and sort of followed it from there, it sort of opened up a bit and we became much more broad-minded and started to listen to alternative TV and, you know, before long we were into 60s stuff because there was an album sleeve of uh, the singer from alternative TV, Mark Perry, surrounded by his favourite records and it was all Zappa and Love and things like that. So we went backwards, I suppose, and found some nice melodies and some good 60s ideas and started to use that went on to Postcard Records and put out our indie singles there. It was totally calm. I couldn't believe the first idea and the first time that someone actually sent a letter to say they had a record and it was from America or something. I just thought, I can't believe this. You write a song in your bedroom and it goes off to someone else's bedroom and they write back to you. A great means of communication, I think. I yes. Um, I consciously wrote it <coughs> for me as a pop song. And um, at the time, I suppose a lot of people were listening to more sort of esoteric music. But I thought it was, you know, prime top of the pops material. I thought it was very catchy. And it turned out to be quite a hit. So the second LP you did, you had Mark Knopfler. How you chose him or you had him chosen for you as producer? Which was it? Mm. Oh, I chose Mark Knopfler as producer. Why? Apart from the fact that it was quite contrary, I suppose, for a Scottish indie band to have someone who was a kind of well-respected, if you like, muso figure. I just thought that some of the music he'd done was great. When he worked on Bill Forsyth films and everything, it was fantastic. And I had a nine-minute song that I wanted to record. I don't think anyone could have recorded that better than him. I think he had lots of good ideas for it. You, say, you sound quite defensive when you say that. Did you get a lot of stick about your choice? Well, he wasn't... 
you know, the favourites at postcard records or anything, you know. I mean, no one would have thought of Dire Straits, but that's not really what interested me. I wanted someone good at the controls, someone who was a good overseer and someone who had good ideas. How did you find it working with him? He was good, very professional, doesn't like to waste time. I suppose I'm quite ambitious in a way, quite selfish in that the band is always changing, always, you know, I'm always like getting different musicians in and trying to improve on things. So there must be a degree of ambition there. Not that kind of blind ambition that tends to permeate the music business though, where it's just like, got to get to the top, got to get to the top. Yeah.